friends and gamers, and welcome to The Fortress. My name is Jinx, and today we're talking about the Joan of Arc strategy for Global War 1936 version 3. So it's a long enough video as it is, let's dive right in. So first of all, why the name? Well, Joan of Arc has been revered as a martyr and a symbol of freedom and independence. She became a national symbol of France. She's this historical character that lived in, well, 1421, somewhere about there, I think she was born. And she was at the time when there was a hundred years war between France and England. And she served to lead some French armies in the relief of the city of Orleans, as you see here up on the screen. And she led them in many victorious campaigns and even stood at the side of King Charles as he was crowned King of France. After that, things didn't go so well, and she was captured by the enemies of France and burnt at the stake by the English. <laughs> the dastardly <the> English. <laughs> but yet, despite that, despite her unfortunate demise, she served to be a symbol of, well, freedom and independence, and to inspire the people of France through the French Revolution, World War I, World War II, and to invigorate the friends of France as well. In regards to the strategy itself, the idea is that France, in its last dying breath, just before it capitulates and surrenders, it strikes a blow, it does this act of war against a neutral nation so as to strengthen its allies and to strengthen Fra free France as well, so that it'll rise up and help France to overthrow its oppressors. That's the idea behind that, and just like Joan of Arc served to inspire the French people throughout its history, that in this sense too, that even with the dying of France, the Republic of France, it still serves to inspire and assist, invigorate, and help the friends of France. So that's, uh, that's the reason I named it such, and I thought it was a suitably apt name. So why make a Global War 1936 version 3 strategy video now? Version 4 is just about to arrive on our doorsteps. Well, it's precisely because we're about to say goodbye to version 3 and embrace the greater game and the better game of version 4 that now is a good time to make this video. I made a video like it about a year ago, but I never ended up posting it publicly because I know that this video is going to be you know, controversial in some circles and cause some waves. It's because the Joan of Arc strategy has been much misunderstood and much maligned amongst some members of the online community. And so I thought I would let it stand on its own two feet to really express the numbers, to express the math, and express the nuts and bolts of how it works and what to account for, what to prepare for, and to let it stand as a viable strategy to have within our strategic toolbox that a person can use. Not to be used in every game. It's not, it's not the penultimate strategy, but it is something a person can do. That's not automatically, game-breakingly, a failure for the person that launches it to do it. I wanted to set that record straight. It's also because the Joan of Arc strategy has been used as the first stone to malign my own reputation, to really spread some lies about me. And that's been really, really difficult for me on some level. I really don't like that much at all. It really turned me off of playing Global War 36 for a long time. The fact that members of the community were taking me to task and spreading some really negative lies and saying some horrible things about me. I really dislike that. It turned me off of making videos, it turned me off of playing this board game in particular, and that really sucks because Global War 36 is my favorite game, and it, historical board gaming, <laughs> I considered it the best board game company in the world. I really enjoyed it that much. And to be turned off from it because what some members of the community say, that was really unfortunate. So the reason I waited until now is so that we can put it all behind us and say, I release this video, and immediately we can step past it and move on to other things. And anybody who has any issue with this can say, ah, oh, you know, that's ancient history. Why are we digging up this past? I'm not going to even address it, they'll say, which is perfectly fine by me. I just simply want to move past it, but I wanted to set the record straight for my own sake as well as posterity. Put it out there, and I don't even care if this video takes it has too many views. I really don't care. But for this video to be out there in the public domain, I'm happy about that. That's why I'm making this video now, and that's why I'm releasing it now as well, on the cusp of greater things that version 4 has to promise. I also know that people don't have lots of time to watch an hour or longer lengthy video, so I thought I'd make a quick strategy summary just for the beginning of the video. Uh, if it goes beyond 15 minutes, uh, if it goes less than 15 minutes, I'll be happy. And the idea there is for people who don't have time to watch a full length video, they just watch the section so they get a grasp of how the strategy works and if it works nicely or not. That's the idea behind it. So stay tuned for the quick strategy summary. We see here in the upper left hand corner, I've put in some income trackers because some of what I say can get confusing and it, so it helps to kind of keep track with what's going on. All right, so let's get started. 
Axis Germany is just about to crush France. We see the armies of Rundstedt approaching Paris, and Paris is desperately fighting to try to win this fight. But it's unfortunate because it will fail. France uses its treasury to declare war on a neutral Iran. So we see here in the upper left-hand corner, relative to the standard game, Germany is now out by 10 bucks. It's 10 IPP that they would have otherwise have gotten. Iran aligns to the Axis and becomes a German territory. And that boosts uh, German income at the end of the turn by plus three for the territory value, but plus two for the wartime bonus as well. Because Iran is Axis controlled, a neutral Iraq aligns to the Axis and becomes German territory as well. So we see that the Ir Iraqi income has been added to the German total layer, the income tracker, and we see a plus five, plus four wartime bonus leaves them relative standard, only negative one overall. The French Declaration of War costs the Allies 10 IPP and reduces USA peacetime income by 8 IPP. Now, the money uh, that France is paying is not is coming out of France's pocket, but it's money that would have otherwise gone to Germany instead, so it's coming kind of a free pass on that one. The American income dropping down by 8 bucks is something that they'll suffer each and every turn, but we'll explain that in the next bit. The British also lose their friendly or neutral Iran wartime bonus relative to standards, so they're at negative 2 IPP. That brings them up to grand total at the end of the German turn to negative 10 IPP. By having two German-controlled territories adjacent to Russia, Russia gets two dice 12 income increases, so one d12 per territory. That's a range of 2 and 24. So it's increasingly likely to get in the higher marks there for 13, 12, 14, somewhere there, but it is also possible for them to hit 2 or 24. And so the idea there is, well, in the, in the purposes of being fair, we're going to play it right down the middle. It's most likely in the middle. There's more combinations of dice that will get us towards the middle. And yes, there's circumstances where it'll be 2, and there's circumstances that will be 24. But the purposes of this strategy video, let's go with 13 as the amount of money they would collect. Germany does not capture the entire French treasury, as 10 IPP have been spent to declare war. As we see here in the upper left hand corner, I'm reiterating some facts. We're negative 10 IPP for the French income, or lost French treasury. But Germany gained the territory income from Iran and Iraq, that's plus 5. And the wartime bonus for those territories, which is plus 4, which brings them up to negative 1. The British subsequently captured territory from Iraq and Iran, boosting their income by plus four. So on the turn that Germany declares war and captures Paris, on the subsequent G British turn, they recapture Iraq and Iran, which gets them to a plus four IPP. But they miss uh, capturing all of Iranian territory and still suffer the negative two wartime bonus. So they're looking at the end of the first turn where they're at war with the major power, negative six IPP relative to standard. On the subsequent turn, they capture that territory, and now they're only suffering negative 3 IPP every turn thereafter. Relative to historical, when the dust settles on the first turn, at the end of the first turn, the axes collect negative 1 relative to standard, the common turn collect anywhere between 2 and 24, we're going at 13, and the allies collect negative 6 IPP. Each turn thereafter, the axis collect 0, and the common turn collect 2 to 24 IPP, and the allies collect negative 3 IPP. Now, this might be a little bit interestingly worded, but the the because the axis held on to Azerbaijan for one turn, they are now broke even absolutely, so they get 0 IPP relative to standard. They didn't get anything compared to the standard game, and now they collect this money relative to standard. The common turn still collect the 13 IPP, and the allies collect negative 3 IPP. That's because they have minus 8 for losing out on the American peacetime income. They have, um, they've captured four, uh, sorry, 5 IPP worth of territory income, and they've recovered their wartime bonus. So 8 minus 5 is a negative 3, or negative 8 plus 5 is a negative 3. So, with one dice roll, we have equal chance of hitting any number on the di uh, on dice 12. We have rolls 1 through 12, we have frequency of this number showing up, it's 8.33% chance of hitting any number on the dice roll. Now, because there are two dice rolls, two territories becoming axis controlled, that means that Soviets get two dice rolls, that means that it's a high frequency of getting the numbers there in the middle of the bell curve. As we see here, the numbers towards the middle are, you know, you have 12 chances of getting a 13. Uh, 12 different combinations of dice that will get you 13. We have uh, you know, 11 chances of getting both 12 and also 11 for 14 as well. And as you see, as it goes outwards, there's less and less chances. A frequency, a chance of getting a 1, uh, sorry, a 2 is very low. Only one combination of dice will get that. So if you look at it, it's an 8.3% chance of getting a 12. And if you look at the outside, it's 0. 
7% chance of getting a 2 or a 24. So it's very likely to be in the middle. And if you know, you know, if you say within the realms of possibility, anywhere between 12 and say, I don't know, 15, uh, or sorry, 10 and 15, uh, or 10 and 16 rather, it's a decent chance of getting that. That's a huge amount of chance of getting somewhere in that range. But we're sticking with 13 for argument's sake. Differences in income relative to historical play. So as you see here, Germany lost 10 bucks of French treasury, but they picked up 9 bucks for Iran, Iraq, and the wartime bonus. So the net on the first turn is a negative 1. Since they held on to one IPP territory into the next turn, they now broke even by turn 2, and now they're even all across the board. They're no further ahead, no further behind. The Allies, because they lost 8 IPP for US income, lost, but they gained territory for Iran and Iraq, they're down by only 6. You know, uh, 8 minus 4 brings us to, or is it 8 minus 4? Oh yeah, 8 minus 4 uh, plus the wartime bonus, so we're looking at negative 6. On the subsequent turn, they recapture Azerbaijan and all of Iran, and now they're only suffering negative 3 each turn thereafter. So by the end of turn 2, they're only suffering minus 3 each and every turn thereafter. Whereas the Soviets, well, they're up on the 13 on the first turn. It could be anywhere between 2 and 24, but we'll just go with 13. And on the second turn, they're 26 bucks ahead relative to standard. On the turn 3, they're, you know, again, 39 bucks relative to standard. Turn 4, 52, and turn 5, 65, right? Now keep in mind, for the Soviets, on the first turn they're at war with a major power, they also get a discount for one IPP for every unit put on the board. So if you're buying nothing but pure militia, that means if in turn five, the historical start date of Barbarossa, you could put another 65 units of at least militia on the map that you wouldn't have otherwise had. That's massive. Now, if you go with something a little bit more expensive, that might not be 65. Let's say, you know, you could do the math. I'm not going to do it right now, but okay, I'll do it right now. 32.5, is that right? 32.5 infantry that you could put on the map. Uh, that's that's a decent amount of extra infantry on the map. That's massive. That's three massive stacks of infantry you can put on the map. Now, of course, you don't have that amount of factories, but you get the idea. You have oodles and oodles of units to put on the board, right? Now, if you compare that to the Allies and how much the Allies lose, it's only 18 bucks on turn five relative to 65 gained by the Soviets. That most likely means that the Allies will never need to send any Lend-Lease to the Soviets for the rest of the game. Most likely, that's what it means. The Americans, yeah, they're down by eight bucks. Uh, the Allies in general are only down by three bucks per turn, you know, that they're losing out, which is only one infantry. But it also means that, you know, Soviets are doing so well that you really don't have to assist them any further. As far as I can gather, that's what it is. Now, that does have its consequences, right? Um, so that's money that you can save as America by not sending it to USSR and keep in your own pocket to, to send to your allies or to build up your own navies for that matter, or build up the Chinese too for that matter as well, if that's the way you want to do it. Or if you think that you still need to help the Soviets, you could send them a few extra bucks as well, if you think that's what needs to be done. So that's that. Now, I want to also bring to mind that Operation Barbarossa, though it historically happened on turn five, now the Soviets are going to be at wartime income sooner. Let's say they're at two peacetime income turns sooner than they otherwise would be. That means that the Germans have to go to war on turn three if they want to still have the Soviet surprise attack ability, which is a worthwhile ability to have. So turn three, and also the longer you wait, the more money that the Soviets have there at their wartime income for several turns longer than they otherwise would be. So turn three, they have to go to war. And they might not be ready for that. That might mean that in turn one, where they're at war with a major power, they have to capture Paris. Turn two, they have to turn around and race to the Eastern Front. And turn three, they have to launch Operation Barbarossa a full year sooner than they otherwise would have. So it's an interesting situation. Now, of course, the, the dice rolls are fickle things. Dice are fickle things. And, and it could be that the peacetime income increases for the Russians are fairly minimal after that. But, you know, if all things being equal and you get a rough dice roll of 7.5 per turn, then we are looking at turn three that the Germans have to go after Russia. It also means that the USA are about one turn behind. That means that the Japanese can wait an extra turn before going to war against the Americans, uh, if they want to, or the British or whatever. But the Japanese are at peace anyways, usually at this time with any major power. So in version 3, that kind of hurts the Japanese to some extent. No, it means that the Anzac are at wartime income, the FEC are at wartime income, and they're using their money and resources to shore up the defenses of their respective territories. And Japan, if they decide, okay, we're going to wait an extra turn to hit, launch Pearl Harbor, that's an extra turn where Anzac and FEC don't have to worry about an attack. So that's it goes both ways. They can send extra units to defend Malaya if they wanted to, build an extra Gurkha or two. So that's worthwhile considering as well. And honestly, um, yeah, it's, it doesn't hurt them that much. It hurts the Japanese in some sense because in version 3 they don't get their uh, wartime bonus income until they're war at a major power, so we're losing out some money there if they have the Dutch islands. 
America's also losing out on their wartime bonus income because they don't get their 13 bucks of bonus income. But that matches up against the Japanese quite nicely. If memory serves, they get Borneo, Java, and Sumatra get a plus two, or is it one IPP per turn? And then some Chinese territories as well get, you know, an extra buck or two there as well. You're looking at not quite 13 IPP, of course, but, you know, we're looking at at least six IPP that the Japanese are missing out on that they otherwise would have, plus the ANZAC and the FEC are active and fighting. So by these stats that I'm sharing with you, and if I have my numbers correct, and I might not, there might be a lot of errors in what I'm putting out here, but by my math on this one, it seems to make sense that this is a situation. In fact, it's very detrimental to the Germans for the Soviets to be benefited in this great way. 65 extra bucks to play around with is huge. So I would say it's not of benefit to the Germans. It might be of benefit to the Allies, and it's definitely of benefit to the Soviets, this strategy. Now, the risk there is that it might make the, German, uh, the Soviets too strong, and that causes other problems. But on the flip side, normally the Allies send some lend lease to the Soviets. In this case, they don't have to, and they could deny them some of the income from the Arctic line as well if they think they're too strong, and thereby kind of balance the books to some extent if they think they're too strong. But I believe at the end of the day, Germany has to pursue after the Soviets so that they they actually themselves become weaker and give the Allies a chance to win in version 3. So Germany has to go after Russia to get their victory points. Soviets, well, they don't need to go after Germany, but you know they're going to be the anvil upon which Germany breaks itself, allowing the Americans and the British to invade France and liberate France. That's the idea there. Now, is that a good strategy or not? It definitely is a way of looking at the map. All right, and that is a quick strategy summary. Now, you might like that, you might not, you might see a lot of errors that I made there, and please let me know if you do, but I think it makes a bit of sense. I think it does help the allies of France more than it does help the Axis. Now, Soviets at this time are the allies of France. We'll see how well that plays out for them, but we'll have to, it's not something they can just casually disregard. I think it does benefit the allies a little bit too. They're only losing out on three IPP worth of income per turn. All right, now we're going to get into the more detailed summary of the rest of the video. The rest of the video will be the strategy, the in-depth strategy, the history behind this, some of the controversy behind the strategy, the comparison between the different versions, perhaps, and the elimination of the strategy via rewriting the rules, um, creating modifications to the rules, or if it's already been eliminated with version 4. That's what the rest of the strategy will hold. Now, if that's sufficient for you, and you want to finish this video now, that's fantastic. I hope you enjoyed it, and maybe you've just re-watching this and need a little refresher of what happens. That's great. <laughs> there are some extra tidbits of information in the next bit of the video that you might like. Uh, you know, different ways to prepare, different things that you need to consider, but I think that's sufficient for the first quick section of the video. Moving on to the next section, thank you all for watching. Let's continue. The strategy itself. First of all, we have to talk about foundational concepts. Well, Joan of Arc strategy is not a silver bullet strategy. What I mean by that is that it is not a winning move that do this and you'll win every single time or 80% of the time. It's not meant to be that kind of strategy. It's not a secret unit kind of, okay, you just got to build this kind of unit and you'll win. In this case, you don't just build a bunch of airborne units and you capture Paris or you capture London or you capture Germany or whatever. It doesn't work like that. It's a bit more complex than that. What it is, is uh, it's also not... a uh, build a special unit like an advanced artillery, let's say. Okay, you build it, your advanced artillery as the Germans um, build a bunch of fortifications and coastline, and now you have plus two on the first round of combat where your advanced artillery is going to roll at six, and they're doing first strikes against the enemy, doing double casualties. You know, just it all adds up. It's not that kind of strategy either. You know, it's something a little bit less uh, a little bit <laughs> different than that. What I describe it as is a type of Carlson strategy. Now, if some of you are like chess, I, I have this kind of, I like chess, but I don't like it a lot. <laughs> I'm fascinated by it. Magnus Carlson is this, is this player, a chess master, and in his younger days, he was a very aggressive player. Now he's a bit more studied, but he's an aggressive and intuitive player. Now, some games in Global War 36, you show up and the German player is a very experienced player. He says, okay, I have a very systematized thing of what I do. I build six medium armor. I build six mechanized. I go and take out this, ta this, uh, this target, and then I go after Yugoslavia, and then I get after Sweden and Norway and build up some, in and then I go to the East Front, and very systematic, very studied approach to what he has to do, very routine, systematic approach to what he wants to build. Now... A Carlson strategy is somebody that comes in and says, okay, I'm up against a person that has this guidebook on what they want to do. I'm going to throw a wrench in their works. 
I'm going to do something different that they don't expect that they'll have to stop and think. Now, Magnus Carlsen was a very intuitive, is a very intuitive player where he didn't study as much of his, as much as his opponents. His opponents would study books and plays by other chess masters that if they came to a situation in the in the setup of the game where they looked at it and said, okay, I know what happens here. I have it memorized. What I do is I react with this, 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 and that gives me this probability of winning. Now, uh, Carlson was uh, intuitive in the sense that he would deliberately do something that was off the books that would set them up into a different thing that the, his opponents had never seen, kind of the mid-game element where his opponents have never seen this thing before. And suddenly his opponent is now on level with him where they both have to rely on their intuition as to what to do and not some pre-studied format of what they need to do. And if they brought them down to that level of that intuitive play, he would beat them. And that's what a Carlson strategy is, to do something somewhat unexpected they haven't seen before, they haven't planned for, they haven't prepared for, and in some ways disrupt their system and in hopes of, of taking that to your advantage. So it works good against systematic players who are very studied in their approach, these Carlson type strategies. Some other Carlson strategy types are, well, you know, you move your transport fleet to a certain position on the map where you can threaten different things, or you build up a bunch of air units that they might not expect where you might go with them, different kind of strategies that throw a wrench in the works. The less predictable you are, the more of a Carlson strategy it is, I would say. And so this embodies that kind of Carlson strategy. You do something very profound and different than now the German player says, Okay, I have to go go war against Russia two turns sooner. They are now a mighty beast. And if I let them sit, if I go in the classic turn five attack against them, I will not win. And so they need to quickly, quickly do something different that they haven't prepared for. They need to, okay, turn one, capture France. Turn two, race to the Eastern Front. And turn three, already start invading Russia. That's how quickly they have to operate. It's an unsettling strategy is one way of putting it. It should only be used under specific pre-planned circumstances. So it's not impulsive. It's not something that the French player says, okay, we're going to do this. It has to be pre-planned. You have to set up your British allies in such a way that they can take advantage of it. And you have to talk about it too on a, on a deeper level than just simply setting them up. You have to plan it from the outset saying, is this something that you want to do this game? Is this something that would be acceptable at the table? Um, and then we need to set up for it. Now, I want to say this up front. To ca recapture that wartime bonus, according to the developers, it has to be not just a Commonwealth unit, not an Anzac unit, not an FEC unit. It has to be a British unit that captures those territories, or at least is present in the battle so you can hand it over to the British. Iraq, it doesn't matter, but the Iranian territories have to go to a British unit. So that's worth thinking about. And so that's why it needs some level of pre-planning. You can't just use FEC units. And also you have to prepare yourself in such a way that your opponent might take advantage of your absence from certain theaters. Say you move some units from Eastern Egypt to take out Iraq and Iran. Well, that might leave an opening for the Italians to come in and capture Egypt. Or same thing with the FEC territory in India. It might leave an opening for the Japanese to come in and capture that territory as well. It's one of those things. And also you don't necessarily want to tip your hand in such a way that, okay, I have units present in trans Jordan, that means that I am going to go in this direction. You have to do it in such a way that you can catch them unawares to some extent. This strategy can be controversial in certain playgroups. So that's a tricky one. That's a tricky one to know where that line is. So this strategy is controversial in some playgroups. It's hard to know where that line is to draw. In version two, I wrote up this article saying the Joan of Arc strategy. And in the very first paragraph, I said, this strategy is ungentlemanly and should not be played. Because in version 2, there was no consequences to the French action of declaring war against Iran. America's income did not drop down by any amount. You just simply proceeded onwards, right? So in version 3, they changed that and created a penalty for America. But in version 2, it was distinctly crossing that line that I myself would not draw. Other playgroups might, but I would not draw that line there. Or that's where I would draw that line. But it is hard to know which playgroups would accept it and which not, because you don't necessarily want to let the cat out of the bag. And certain playgroups might think certain things are, you know, controversial that other playgroups might not. So, for instance, if you move a Jap uh, French sub over to the Pacific, and when France falls, that French sub now becomes a Japanese sub. The idea there is, would you rather have a Japanese sub in the Pacific, where it's not at war with the British Commonwealth or ANZAC, and only at war with China? Or would you rather have a, Jap a French sub becoming a German sub in the Mediterranean or the Atlantic, and threatening all the enemies that Germany has at the time, which is the Commonwealth and France. Which would you rather have? And nine times out of ten, somebody will say, well, I'd rather have the Japanese sub in the Pacific. So is that 
controversial is that ungentlemanly where you're metagaming the system with anticipating France will fall and sending your submarines to a place where you're not even at war with you're sending them to the Pacific you're at peace with everybody in the Pacific you're at war with Germany why would you send them there you can see war is looming on the horizon why would you send your units to the Pacific so certain people's suspension of disbelief you know you have to plan it out and see kind of what you guys think individually uh, what's acceptable or not the game is meant to be fun after all if you play a game and make enemies with everybody around you, you're not going to be invited back you have to play according to the table you have to come to some ideas of what you want to do you have to play in such a way as to be invited back and to engender a friendly spirit amongst everybody those are the most enjoyable games for me to play and i would hope for everybody else games that are fun you have to consider the community at large as well and by that i mean is your play group might find this tactic acceptable but the community at large might not so take for instance in version two if you played what i would call what was it what did i used to call it? i wrote up an article as well the drunken bear rule or drunken bear exploit where as the soviets you could declare war on south america somewhere argentina brazil uh, you exploited a rule where america can now jump to wartime and come and declare war against um, you know soviets or germany that's a massive exploit. Now, if your playgroup is content with that, and you do that in your playgroup, well, you're also feeding into a community at large. You're, you're engendering a spirit that you might not like, where people are very cutthroat in their spirit behind the game. <laughs> you might want something a little bit more peaceful, where you don't do things just for the sake of it. And so for, for me, when I came to the, the Drunken Bear exploit, I would say this is, a, this is a bad exploit that needs to be fixed. In regards to version 2, Joan of Arc, I said, ah, this should not be played. It's unsportsmanlike. It shouldn't be played this way. It's not fair. It's, it's unforeseen. Uh, event that the developers haven't taken account to. So it's one of those things that you have to consider the community at large, though your own playgroup might accept it, the community at large might not. And so you might need to, if you do share this with the community, you might need to preface it by saying, we wanted to try this out. It's not something that uh, we, you know, that we're, we want to try all the time, but something we wanted to see what would, how much it would mess up the game or something like that, just so that they know the community at large knows that, hey, you guys aren't, you know, deliberately shirking the system in some very a profane way <laughs> moving onwards okay the meta consideration behind the game this is more specific to the board game table the acceptance of the strategy by other players at the table okay so we've covered that in some sense but i wanted to elaborate on it further your play group might have seen it your play group might accept it and so that's one thing but if you're sitting down at the table of people and you're thinking like hey you know i could do this and you don't actually know the people around the table you need to talk about it in some roundabout way to not let the cat out of the bag you need to say, okay, well, what do you guys think about me sending my French submarines over to the Pacific? Is that acceptable to you guys? And if people say, oh, yeah, that's fine. You know, why not? Sure. Okay, so you know that you haven't crossed the line there. If you say as Germany, okay, I'm going to build, um, I don't know what would be in a particular exploit. I'm going to build nothing but um, cavalry, right? Nothing but cavalry all across the board, just tons and tons of cavalry. Um, yeah, that might be an exploit. It might not. It depends on, on, on I, I haven't tried that one out particularly. But let's say you're nothing but cavalry has Germans. And you reach out to the community and they say, oh, no, I've seen that one of my games. It was devastating. You can't play it that way. Let's not play that thing. Then you can back off and say, okay, that's a bit too far. So they might not accept this Joan of Arc strategy as well. You kind of find, feel the ground out to see where it's at. So that's all that, that item there, that bullet point is pointing out to. You need to find out if this strategy is acceptable by other members of the table. And if people are not accepting of it, even if one individual is not accepting of it, maybe it's best to back off. You have to also talk to the allies, to your allies there. So if you're playing as America, and America usually plays uh, France because otherwise America would be very boring, but some games, some people play Britain playing as France too. So you need to talk to your allies and say, hey, is this acceptable for me to do? If you're playing Britain and France, you talk to the Americans and say, is this something that sh we should do? I know that keeps you out of the war for one turn. It also means you have a little less income to play around with. Is it acceptable or not? And you kind of play it by ear in that regards. They might not like the idea. Likewise, uh, if you're playing as America and France, you might, the British player might not be comfortable with the idea of potentially moving some units from Calcutta towards Iran or uh, Cairo towards uh, Transjordan to hit Iraq. They might not be comfortable with that, so you need to talk about it with them. You need to consider the competency and the ca capability of the Axis. So if you're playing against um, a non-intuitive German player, let's say a very steadfast, stolid veteran of World War One. you know, where he proceeds gradually and with a certain systematic way of doing things, he might not react well to this uh, strategy. You know, he might, it might be to your advantage. But what about if he is very quick on his feet and can react quite quickly? 
right? He set himself up in a position where he can, he always has multiple options to use his armies with. Let's say he's playing the Italians and he sees the British move some forces in a position to hit Iraq and Iran. He says, ah, now's my opportunity. I strike south and try to capture Cairo. This is my great big chance to do something with them, right? You have to, you, if you're playing against a very intuitive, competent, quick on his feet, Rommel type character, <laughs> you might want to not do this strategy. Likewise, perhaps the Japanese too are in a position that they could hit the east coast of Africa. Maybe it's worthwhile waiting a little bit or not doing the strategy at all, depending on their competency. You have to think of the competency and capability of the common turn themselves. This strategy increases the Soviet income by about 13 IPP and gets them to wartime income two turns sooner than they otherwise would be. That means that they're going to be quite a bit more powerful, which means that they might not even need any American lend lease, which is good for the Americans, but also means that there's no leash that you can attach to the Soviets now. They can kind of run wild and uncontrolled. They could say, all right, no, we're doing fine economically. We're going to push back the Germans and start taking over the rest of Europe. It's that push-pull mechanic that the Allies see oftentimes in their games where you know, they, they can't really open up a second front in Europe, or even a first front in Europe, until Germany has opened up their front against the Eastern Front. And then they can gauge, okay, now's that tipping point where the Soviets are starting to push the Germans back. Now's our chance to invade. Because, uh, and if you don't have that ability, or if the Soviets don't need your lend lease, then you can't really adjust that tipping point. You just have to go by watching what they're doing and saying, okay... The tipping point has always been in their favor. Now we really have to push hard and capture our territory, right? It's one of those interesting things. So you have to judge the competency and capability of the common turn as well. They might also say, all right, you know, we're not going to, you know, they're going to see what happens. And they see that the British have cop captured southern Iran and Iraq. And they're like, haha, we have an airborne unit that we're going to capture Azerbaijan with. Boom, captured it. Now you'll never get your wartime bonus as well. You have to judge the competency, capability, and trickery of the common turn and see if you can find some middle ground there. There needs to be a special consideration for the USA player, a second consideration, let's say. America will be out of the war if you do the strategy for an extra turn. Uh, maybe even two turns if the rolls are bad, but relative to the standard, it should just be one turn. So that means they'll be in their splendid isolation for one turn. Are they okay with that? Or will they say, look, you know, I'm here for the, I'm here for a two-day event. I don't want to start my game and only have three turns of, of gameplay in me before I, I walk away and go home, you know, or whatever it is, four, five, six turns of gameplay before I go home. They might want to be in the war a little sooner. And so even though the strategy might be perfectly feasible and everything else checks off, the, the USA player might be like, you know what, that's not super fun for me. I don't really want to do that. And so you have to consider it. And you have to be like, okay, fair enough. Let's not do that. Just because it's the best spirit to promote the best in the community, the best within us in the community. There needs to be a special consideration of Japan as well. If Japan says, I'm going to starve America out of income, I'm not going to invade China, and I'm not going to invade the Dutch East Indies. Haha, -ha, now America is going to be, let's say, three turns behind where they would otherwise would be. And now the French are doing this strategy against Iran. Okay, so it's you know, a good three turns. America is going to be only in the war, what would it be, January 1943, somewhere there. <laughs> That's a long time to wait. There's not too much game time left before the end of the game then. So there needs to be a consideration there as well. If Japan is not being hyper-aggressive, perhaps America shouldn't be either. But if you have, you know, on that same token, maybe the American player is like, okay, that's cool by me. You know, if they haven't invaded China, then I can play as China and I have fun with it as well. Worthwhile thinking about. The Sino-Japanese war is worth thinking about too. If Japan has invaded China and America is still out of the war for one extra turn than they otherwise would be compared to a standard game, that might be an extra turn where China really suffers. It says, you know, I, I could have held out with that one extra turn, but just because America is one turn behind, ah, I can't do it, and they collapse and surrender. Now, I've never seen China ever fully taken off the board. I've gotten close to taking China off the board and crunch them into only one territory, but I've never taken them off the board completely. And yeah, I've been lucky enough to be against fairly competent opponents. <laughs> there hasn't been a there hasn't been a, 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 a dud amongst the bunch. Anyways. Then we have to think about the Dutch-Japanese War. So say Japan has captured all of the Dutch East Indies. Well, now what? Maybe they're in a position to take advantage of their positioning there with their naval bases and take out Calcutta or reach further, you know, further west and take out uh, the fleet that you just used to deposit units in uh, southern Iran. So worthwhile thinking about as well. All right, so those are all the considerations that should be addressed before the game starts. Let's move on to deal-making. We need to bring the USSR on board. If the French 
whether they be played by the Americans or played by the British decide to do the strategy. And everybody else is on board. Then you talk to the USSR and see what they think about it. If they say, you know what, um, no, I want, I, I want Azerbaijan and um, I need Azerbaijan for my extra victory point. I'm not going to let you have it. I'm going to position units in such a position that I can capture it. With a couple of cavalry units, let's say, or whatever it is, I can capture it just like that. You know, if time caps. Now, of course, that's a bit tricky for them. Because a declaration of war against Germany would forfeit their wartime income. But if it was just Iranian, Iranian neutral Iran, they might have a chance to get it, right? They might have a chance to grab at least the northern part of Iran. So that's worthwhile talking to them about as well. Um, now that might be an argument for saying, no, no, we're definitely going to do the strategy now because we don't want you to have it. And so first opportunity you get, you do the strategy. That's another way of thinking about it. Now, we see in this image here, this political cartoon, we see a British soldier and a Russian soldier beating the carpet of Persia. And we see all these uh, uh, undesirable Nazi characters flying out of it. <laughs> people, for people forget that the Soviets and the British did invade Iran. But in this case, we don't want the Soviets to invade Iran whatsoever because we need that wartime bonus. We need to arrange Lend-Lease. Now, I've always been a strong proponent for America sending a lot of its Lend-Lease money to people, right? My thinking is, okay, so let's say you have four turns, four turns before America's in the fight. Well, that means uh, it's going to be more like five or even six, but let's say I have five turns, four turns anyways, four turns before America's into the war. That's, if you send a Lend-Lease British fighter, a uh, Lend-Lease of a British fighter to England, that British fighter is now participating in the war for four turns. Now, you could say, okay, four turns, and then you send another fighter in turn two, another fighter in turn three. So you have, you know, you have a lot of money. You have like, you know, 30 IPPs of money, respectively doing, you know, spending many a turn assisting the British in what they need to do. And because America is one turn behind in regards to being active and present in the war, they might need that extra help. They might, they might not. One turn is not that big of a difference. And also, Germany now has to worry about a stronger USSR. So Germany might not be in a position where they could take advantage of uh, the absence of the Americans for an, uh, an extra turn, right? So it's not, might not matter much at all. But the Chinese might need that benefit as well. The Chinese might need, say, uh, another fighter or something like that to really assist them. And maybe you might need to twist the British arm and say, no, you got to send them an anti-aircraft unit and I will send you a fighter just to make things square so they can hold off the Japanese. You got to think about lend in that regards to assist everybody out. And there's also that slim chances that USSR also needs an extra little boost of lend as well. They have that extra bucks of income from the, the peacetime income increases, but there's also that chance that they rolled really, really badly and only got say two bucks of increase to their peacetime income as opposed to the whole 13. That would be quite difficult and it's a risk and maybe it's not a worthwhile risk for people to take, right? I should have said this on earlier on in the video. That slim chance of getting only two bucks is probably not that great. Of course, if you get 24 bucks, that's that's you know, the opposite extreme where now you have 24 bucks of extra Soviet income to play around with. But you know, that two bucks is a little scary thought there too. The USSR might need that income. You also need to assist the British Empire with your advice, let's say, to really maybe project some threats to say, okay, I'm going to put my fleet in this position here, and that means that in case I roll really well with my peacetime income increases, I could be participating in the war immediately, you know, something like that, plan it out in such a way. Now that's it for the, the slideshow portion. The next section I'm going to deal with is the preparation, and then I'm going to deal with the actual movements themselves, the preparation for war, the movements to war, and everything as it unpacks there. But because slideshows can get boring for everybody, I'm going to do the rest of it in person with a video camera. So see you in a moment. Hello, friends and gamers. All right, so stage four, preparation and execution of the Joan of Arc strategy. I'm going to say right up front that this map here has not been adjusted to 1939 or 1940 standards. You see that certain nations are weak, you see certain nations are not present or ahistorical on the map, you see that nationalist Spain has not conquered all of Spain, that Britain is weaker, Germany is weaker, we see all kinds of things that are a little bit different than you'd expect in the 1939 setup. There is just too many variables involved in the map that I didn't think it would be worthwhile to that extent to try to redo and recreate a 1939 setup. All right, let's dive right in. So I think in regards to preparation for the Allies, the key word here is operational flexibility that they can react to fortunate circumstances and also unfortunate circumstances on the map, whatever they may be. So for instance, let's say that Germany has made a couple, you know, they've done things a little bit differently. They've built up their industry and now they have six major factories. Or perhaps they have a magnificent submarine fleet and maybe they have a large Luftwaffe force, but they're a little bit light on the army portion 
of going into France. And so therefore, perhaps France has not fallen. I think a key feature for this, for any British strategy or any kind of ally strategy is to prepare for the eventuality or the potential for France to survive. Now, there's several factors to it. Is if you prepare for that fact that France might survive, it might hold off the Germans from going into France one extra turn. And that in itself is good. And it definitely benefits the Soviet player perhaps to some extent. It also benefits the French player maybe a little bit. They have a little bit more money to spend and the British player as well. There's a few other factors that kind of play into that idea, but it is a benefit to potentially slow or put the brakes on the Germans a little bit more if possible. So that's one thing they should prepare for. Say for instance, the Germans have taken out Denmark, Netherlands, Belgium, um, Poland, and now they've gone after Norway as well. And they just a little bit too light to take out all of France. And say perhaps France has decided, okay, I'm gonna defend Paris, but I'm also gonna hold on to one territory so that France is not surrounded. And that territory is Aquitaine, which is the current meta of holding on to Aquitaine. And so French forces, our German forces have now approached and they say, okay, our tank forces are too light to take out uh, Aquitaine itself. I think Britain should be prepared in such a position to be able to take out or to land forces in reinforcement of Aquitaine, allowing French units to move up into Paris itself. Something along those lines. Perhaps France has fallen. In that case, well, let's say Paris itself has, has not been attacked, but the surrounding outskirts have been, and Germany has gone to the outskirts here, and now they've only left the three tanks here, perhaps two tanks here, and everything else has been wiped out. Now, perhaps the British have prepared themselves with two transports here to land some units here, followed with air support as well, to land units here in Aquitaine and wipe out the German tanks. Maybe that's a benefit to them. So that's worthwhile thinking about as well. Preparing for the survival of France and giving yourself operational flexibility for that, as well as, well, maybe taking out a couple nice targets if at all possible, right? Perhaps the Germans, well, you know, there's a whole host of different things that could happen. But preparing yourself for multiple eventualities all across the board, not just here in France itself, but everywhere else. But let's say in this circumstance that the Joan of Arc strategy has taken place and France has been is just about to capitulate. Paris itself has been attacked in this scenario. They're on the last combat roll. And so France pauses the combat and says, I spent 10 IPP from my territory to declare war on to declare war on Iran. And that's what they decide to do. And it seems to be the right thing to do. Now we look over here at the map at the target of this aggression and we say, OK, again, I want to stress what we're going after here is not the aggrandizement or the benefit of the Allies to the extent where it's the obvious choice. In this case, for me, the best benefit of the strategy is the 12 chances on the combination dice roll. So the 12 different combinations that will get the Russians 13 IPP if these two territories turn German. Now, there's 12 chances for it to turn uh, get a result of 13 IPP from these two dice rolls. There's 11 chances for it to be 12 and another 11 for it to be 14. There's 10 chances for it to be... Uh, 10 and uh, another 10 for it to be 15. And you see what I mean? It kind of reduces as it gets to the outskirts. I might have my numbers wrong a little bit, but there's only one combination of dice that will get you two and one combination of dice that will get you 24. And it's pretty slim chances, although it's still likely it's a slim chance for that to happen. Although dice are fickle things, you can completely get wrecked by them. And I've seen that happen, not in this strategy, but in other stuff as well, where somebody just locks out and rolls the perfect number and it, you know, just everything just goes together for them. But this is the ultimate goal behind that, that Russia gets a pile of money and they're collecting this each and every turn from day one of this attack and thereby hastening the German need to attack Russia by at least two turns. That's the goal. And the idea there is, well, you know, if, if Russia just saves that money, you have something like 39 IPP by the time Germany does declare war. And with the 39 IPP, well, you know, that's 39 potentially militia you could put on the board. And that's quite nice. That's a nice, tidy sum. At that point, the Allies don't need to send any more lend to Russia because Russia is doing pretty well by itself. In fact, you know, maybe maybe they've overdone it a little bit. And maybe, you know, <laughs> maybe things aren't so good. Maybe, you know, uh, anyways, you get what I mean, is perhaps it tips the scales and makes it difficult for the Axis themselves to do much. And maybe they break against the stronger anvil of the Soviets, allowing a D-Day attack against France, uh, against Germany in France, all the sooner. Perhaps two turns sooner, two turns sooner. Well, that's not a bad outcome from that. Okay, let's take a look at this here. So, first of all, these units become German. And so Germany still has a non-combat move with them. They might say, all right, well, you know, here we are in this position. What are we going to do with these guys? Well, we have a few different options. Perhaps let's move to Azerbaijan. It's worth one IPP. Let's move there. Or they might say, you know what? Um, no, maybe a better option is to get our units up here in northern Iran and one up here in Azerbaijan. You know, for whatever reason, that might seem to be the best option to them. 
perhaps because it's a little bit farther from the outcome. But let's go with what I've seen most often, the units move up to Azerbaijan. And now Germany on the subsequent turn, because Britain is unlikely to be able to capture that. So now Germany says, you know what, I'm going to throw a militia in there as well, because why not make it a little bit harder for the Allies to capture that territory. All right, so that's roughly what the Germans do in there. Now, what are the Allies? How have they prepared for all this to happen? I wanted to pause right here in post-production and say that at this point here, it really depends on what the Germans have done. And it depends also what Russia has rolled for their income increases. They may have gotten extraordinarily lucky and got two 12s on the dice rolls. And now they say, well, I'm practically at my wartime income. I don't have to worry about the Germans attacking me before I'm at my wartime income anyways. I could just declare war on Germany right now and actually invade Azerbaijan and capture that territory. So this has to be kind of built into the agreement with the Russians where you arrange with them and say, you have to keep your troops away from that Transcaucasus border. You have to keep them far enough away. And you have to, you know, airborne units, you know, even including that in some sense, kind of agree to something and say, keep them far enough back that you won't be able to take Azerbaijan because you don't want them to capture that territory. You need to have this agreement where you can keep on collecting your income. So this is the, one of the points of, one of the extreme points of vulnerability that the Allies have in regards to the strategy, the fact that the Soviets can backstab them at this point. You know, have they prepared for an attack here uh, against one or two or three units? Have they prepared an attack against here uh, with potentially three units there as well? You have to prepare for a maximum of three units in these two territories, uh, perhaps four, well, three units in this case against this territory and this territory as well. And you have to plan out, you have to prepare for it. Now, this one is not as bad. You know, ideally, of course, you have to capture Iran so you get your wartime bonus back. But yes, I, you know, you have to be prepared for this eventuality as well. In theory, what I should actually be doing is putting three infantry in both those spots here so we can demonstrate the worst case scenario that you have to prepare for both these eventualities, right? Okay, so what have the Allies prepared for in this regard? Well, let's talk defensively first. First of all, the Allies have prepared themselves in such a way to prevent the Japanese from saying, hey, Calcutta and the FEC territory in general is weak. Now we can capture this territory. Yes, of course, it's going to bring America into the fight, but let's do it anyways, because that seems to be worth our time. So you have to prepare for that. And it's unlikely, of course, because now Japan's going to be rubbing its hands and saying, perfect, you know, America's going to be out of the war for one extra turn. That's pretty good for me. Um, yeah, perfect. You know, I, got, I could clean up China. Uh, I could take care of business there if I need to. That's one thing that they might think about. <laughs> Another thing they might think about is, uh, well, you know, uh, Anyway, so they might say a few different things like, oh, we can take out FEC territory here, or it might give us an option for whatever reason to take out or make a landing in African territory for some odd reason that they might think is beneficial. So you have to kind of prepare for a couple different outcomes. For me, I think the Indian territory is the more likely option between the two, although it is still unlikely as far as I'm concerned. I think Japan will take the opportunity of staying neutral for one extra turn if America is down eight bucks on its peacetime income, in my opinion. So that's one thing to prepare for defensively. The other thing to be prepared for defensively is here in Egypt that you have to think about that, well, you know, now if I move a lot of my units this direction, that means that the Italians might move into Western Egypt or Eastern Egypt and also make a landing there as well. So you have to prepare for that defensively as well. Another thing you have to prepare for is kind of reactively to the previous turn. Let's say that Italy has decided to join the fight. They've been aggressive. In version 3, it's less likely for Italy to be aggressive because we often see Italy kind of stay out of the fight. But in this case, Italy has decided, nope, we're going to make our push into southern uh, France. And Germany is now going to grab all of that. We'll hold on to southern France. That'll be good for us. And thereby, it means that... Um, by doing that, we're in the war, sure, but we, we have good hold on Rome, uh, we're doing fine. So you might want to be prepared for reaction in capturing part of, let's say, using this fleet to come up here and capture the Italian northern co North African colonies, or even make a landing in the boot itself, or Sicily for that matter. Prepare yourself for a few different operations. Again, uh, tactical flexibility or strategic flexibility is the key word here, as far as I'm concerned. Preparing for a lot of different outcomes. But let's say that Italy has gone the classic route of not being too involved in the fight at this time and kind of waiting for an extra turn or two to go by. And, and they see that Egypt itself has been reinforced quite nicely. And so they say, okay, you know, we're, we're not going to do anything just yet. So now's our target of, uh, now's our chance to do something about it. Like I said, we have to prepare for the eventuality that there might be three infantry here and three infantry here. Now, in this case, there won't be an extra militia there because this will happen on the non-combat of the first German turn. And so the British can react to this one. The, the militia might show up in here or here on the subsequent turn. Okay, now 
what do we have as resources to attack in either of those places? We have some cavalry units here. So these armored cars are cavalry. We can have them from this position here. They can hit 1-2 in southern Iran. Or you can put them here in Benares, if you think that's a better option, and go 1-2 via Punjab. Now, that does give you some flexibility to go eastwards as well, if need be, towards Burma. But, you know, you might want to also be in that position. Different options. Or you might decide, hey, you know, I'm worried that the Japanese might attack in one of my lend uh points of uh, harbors, essentially, where I, they could drop off troops because they could receive then these here and here. So you might want to reinforce that position for whatever reason. I'm just giving you all kinds of different options. So that's one thing to prepare for. Now, the other thing is you have this force here. You have two infantry, two Marines. Now, you don't need to have this combination of units. You could have more, you could have less, you could throw in some cavalry if you like. You have a few different options. And now these guys can react by dropping troops in southern Iran or in Iraq. Now it's got a tiny sliver of territory here. We can land units there as well if we so see fit. So is that sufficient? Well we have the you know shore bombardments, a decent amount there, and you know we have some nice marines and such to take the brunt of attack. So that's something you could do. Now you also have this force, I've already stated that you can react to issues in the Italian boot. So perhaps you want this to be a little bit stronger to react to stuff. Even perhaps you might want them to be stronger so they can put units down in British Malaya if need be. Different options available there anyways. Now, what else? You also want to take as much territory as you can, so Iraq. Now, if these three infantry are here, you still have these units that can land in that position. You can have units that come up from Transjordan as well to help grab that territory as well, or you can grab this territory. Now, I think it's most likely that these guys will move up to this position here. And so that means that you're going to be, well, you're faced with an extra militia here, but you'll be able to grab these territories without any combat, if that's what you want to do. We have a few different options there too, right? Okay, so... Then you have your fighters. Now your fighters can hit most places here. They could go one, two, three, four. They can land in that territory there in Maharashtra. Or, you know, they can't hit a little bit further north because you don't own any territories closer. I mean, you could go one, two, three. No, you can't. You, you, yeah, one, two, three. You can't get back to Transjordan. Um, it's basically your only options is these two territories here, which is not bad because if they decide to hold the coasts here, that will be your most likely defense area. Okay, so then you have your airborne unit. Now your airborne unit can potentially go and grab uh, up here in uh, northern Iran. If they've moved their units out of there, just grab that extra territory. Why not? Or you might say, you know what, I'm not going to devote those resources there because then on the subsequent turn, these guys can kind of come in and attack that territory. So I'm not going to risk losing that guy. I'm just going to keep him parked here or... Now what you might see is you might see the British, you might see the Germans you move up there. So you move these guys up here in whatever combination you like. And now you see that, okay, the Germans decide the best course of action is to move here. And in that case, in that case, if they do that, well, these guys are out of position and you're only attacking with these guys here. Maybe they've built a militia there. Now you're looking at four units in this position and now you only have one, two, three, four, five, six, and two of them are Marines, so a little bit more valuable units. And yes, maybe your fighter is still in position to react there or maybe you've moved him off somewhere else. Maybe the strategic bomber has also moved off and now you're a little bit too weak to go into that territory. Something to keep in mind as well. You need to have all these held by a British unit, not a FEC, not an ANZAC. We have to have them all captured buy a British unit so you can get get your wartime bonus. <laughs> That's one thing that, that we got straight from uh, one of the developers. As, as far as I remember, anyways, this might be misquoted. So, you know, don't quote me on that. But this is, let's see what the grapevine says. It has to be held by the a British unit for you to capture that uh, wartime bonus back. So yeah, a few things to consider in this regards, right? Now, there's other things to parse over in your mind as well as options what to do. For instance, you might say, okay, well, you know, uh, France survived or I decided for whatever reason not to use that uh, Joan of Arc strategy, so I'm going to use this strategic bomber to do other stuff instead. Perhaps I'm going to go attack something, uh, maybe the French factory if I could reach it, or something along those lines, maybe the Roman factory. <laughs> well, maybe in that case you want to have it positioned here. Well, will that work? Well, one, two, three, four, five, six. You can reach from this position with strategic bomber, you can go one, two, three, four, five, six, and land in Maharashtra if you want to with your airborne unit and thereby it kind of keeps your options open to react to business over there or there or something else. Something to keep in mind. Now your fighters, as I said before, your fighters, one, two, three, four, five, six. Your fighters can only do that. Maybe I haven't said this, but if your fighters are stationed here, if you have an airbase here and long range aircraft, you can hit these two territories and land in Maharashtra as well. So that's something worth thinking about. Okay, I think that covers 
a lot of the tactical elements behind this. Now, a few little tidbits, a little extras at the end of it. If you do move your fleet into this position, your British fleet here, keep in mind, you're going to be out of position to react to any Italians there. So you have to, you know, you have to consider that in mind as well. Perhaps that's not where you want to go. Or if you want to go in that direction, maybe it's just your, uh, your transports that go there and the rest of your fleet stays in position or moves that way. But keep in mind also that the Japanese might say, hey, no, look, you know, I wasn't at war, but now that there's two tasty transports there, I'm going to use my sub here to go one, two, three and capture that territory as well. So a few different factors to keep in mind. Um, it depends on what your fleet does up here. Have they come into position to kind of cow the Italians and keep them out of the war or what have they done? So different things to keep in mind in this regard. Keep yourself open to a lot of tactical flexibility, thinking about a lot of different options, preparing on all different fronts, preparing for Japan and what they might do. Are they going to be aggressive and push against you or will they take the opportunity of America being out of the war for one additional turn to just, you know, play nice? Will the Italians play nice as well or have they been sufficiently cowed by the presence of the Royal Navy to not do anything? Or perhaps the Germans say, all right, well, you know, of all the axis, the Germans can't really do too much about it. They're going to be thinking hard about, okay, now we really have to push against the Russians. Unless, of course, you rolled really badly and only got two, <laughs> two, um, inc uh, only two IPB of income increase for the Russians. And they say, ah, ha, ha, you know, you guys, uh, yeah, have fun with that. <laughs> now, you know, even if you hit three IPP difference, you know, if the Russians, uh, their income increases three IPP. At the end of the day, it just balances out to what the what the Americans or what the Allies lost. They're down three IPP every turn. Russia's up three IPP. Realistically, that's not too much lost. The potential gains are thirteen IPP or even up to twenty four IPP. And the downsides are well, you might be as low as negative one net overall for the entire thing. Different ways of looking at it. That talks about the execution of this, the cautions about, you know, hitting, you know, what to expect from the Germans, how they might react to that by pushing into these territories. That kind of covers all kinds of different ground there in that regards. I think that's sufficient. If you have any questions, please comment on it below. I feel like I've done an okay enough job, although I feel perhaps <laughs> there's probably a lot more to be desired. Thank you all and handing it off to the next stage.